Hello, I'm Miranda Reinson, a wildlife biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Welcome to the next installment of the State of Deer and Elk series on elk and mule deer winter feeding. In this video, I will cover the department's winter feeding program, including big game, biology, legislative statute, policies, and the role of the Regional Winter Feeding Advisory Committee. I would like to start by sharing information about a few of the adaptations mule deer and elk have developed to help them survive the stress of winter. Deer and elk have a biological strategy to endure winters by reducing their metabolic output and relying on the body fat they have built up on summer and fall ranges. Winter poses a period of high stress and exposure, and more severe winters can be detrimental to populations. Mule deer are more susceptible to large-scale die-offs during severe winters, whereas elk can be affected individually, but it is uncommon for elk to be impacted on the population level. Adult female mule deer and elk survival is important to overall population productivity and is typically high during average Idaho winters. More severe winters can lower female survival. Therefore, the department has focused much of our monitoring efforts on this segment of populations. Most Western state wildlife agencies will feed to prevent or reduce conflicts with agriculture or public safety, which Idaho calls baiting. Baiting refers to trying to keep mule deer and elk off highways or to not allow elk and cattle to interact on feed lines. On the other hand, mule deer are more likely to be fed in emergency situations in an attempt to reduce winter mortality. We have fed mule deer and elk under both scenarios to bait them away from conflict and to provide supplemental nutrition during severe winters. There is statute in place that dictates how feeding operations are funded an administrative rule that specifies when winter feeding should occur. By state law, for every deer, elk, and pronghorn tag the department sells, $1.75 is set aside for the emergency winter feeding account. Money can only be spent on the purchase of winter feed, which includes pellets or hay, for deer, elk, and pronghorn, other feeding operation expenses, and habitat projects benefiting winter range restoration. The department's feeding policy states that big game populations should be maintained under natural conditions and by naturally available forage. The department will work with land management agencies to maintain winter ranges in a manner that allows our big game populations to meet management objectives. Occasionally, severe winters create periods of additional stress on big game populations when winter forage becomes limited, unavailable, or animals are forced into areas that affect public safety. Although we cannot and should not manage big game populations based upon these adverse extreme weather conditions, the administrative rule and policy outline the circumstances under which emergency feeding may be considered. The department may declare a feeding emergency if one or more of the following criteria are met. To prevent damage to private property or for public safety, to prevent excessive mortality of big game populations that would affect the recovery of the herd, or when winter forage is limited or unavailable because of fire or unusual weather. Administrative rule also provides that the department may develop additional re regional guidelines within the listed criteria based on disease transmission risk, local conditions, and local public input. Staff consult with their winter feeding advisory committees to determine when these conditions are met and make recommendations to begin feeding. These committees act as liaisons between the department, interest groups, and the public and make recommendations on when to begin feeding. There are four regions in the state that have standing feeding advisory committees, the Southwest, Magic Valley, Southeast, and Upper Snake regions. Each committee is comprised of five members of the public. There is much coordination that goes into implementing a winter feeding operation. Finding space large enough in an appropriate location is challenging and comes with cooperation from landowners. Additionally, organizing personnel, equipment, and having enough feed can sometimes be difficult to secure for the length of the feeding operation. Winter months cause a deficit in the amount and quality of forage present on the landscape, and the digestive systems of both deer and elk adapt to these changing conditions throughout the year. The feed we select needs to be compatible with those digestive system changes. Additionally, deer and elk are built different in both stature and digestive tract size, so the feed selected needs to align with those differences as well. Mule deer digestive systems are smaller and more specialized, making them less adapt 
susceptible to dramatic changes in forage. The bacteria in their gut gradually changes throughout the year in response to the quality of forage they are consuming. The department feeds deer a specially designed pellet with 15% digestible protein, which is typically compatible with a deer's digestive system in the winter. Deer that are given feeds that don't align with their winter dietary needs can die rapidly and often with a stomach full of food from a variety of causes. That is one of many reasons why we discourage the public from feeding deer in the winter. Elk are mainly fed to mitigate public safety concerns, depredation issues, and mediate livestock interaction. Elk are hardy animals, and while severe winters cause stress, it is rare for elk populations to experience large winter die-offs. Elk can be fed a wide variety of forage during winter because the size of their digestive system allows them to process a wider variety of diets. However, their systems are still adapted to lower quality forage during the winter months and the introduction of forage high in protein or carbohydrates, such as corn, apples, or late cuts of pure alfalfa hay can be detrimental. The department understands it is not easy for anyone to watch deer and elk struggle when trying to navigate deep snow and freezing temperatures, and the department considers public sentiment in decisions on winter feeding. This is challenging to accommodate public desires and meet expectations. For example, location is important. Is the feedback we're receiving specific to a few highly visible deer in an urban setting or on a hillside close to a major roadway? Are the conditions those deer are experiencing reflective of what the overall deer population is experiencing? Timing. Is feedback centered around one big storm in an otherwise mild winter and is therefore unlikely to affect overall mortality rates? Although we routinely receive public input to winter feed, it's not always needed and conditions often don't meet the criteria set forth in our winter feeding policy. Even when conditions are met to justify winter feeding or baiting, there are risks and consequences that should be considered. Feeding can result in changes in animal behavior, such as returning to a feed site in subsequent years expecting a meal. Feeding may also hold animals on winter range longer than normal, potentially negating some of the benefits associated with migration. Concentrating animals on winter range over the course of several years may result in habitat degradation, increased predator presence at the feed sites, and can facilitate the spread of disease, including chronic wasting disease. While emergency winter feeding and baiting creates some organizational and logistical challenges and comes with some inherent risks, the department will continue to evaluate the need to winter feed when and where conditions and circumstances warrant. We consider many variables in the decision to feed and the answers are not simple. What are we trying to accomplish? Is it related to public safety, depredations, separation of elk and cattle, or to reduce mortality? If we initiate baiting or feeding, are we likely to achieve our goals? Do we have ample space and any associated landowner cooperation to accomplish our goals? What are the specific risks of baiting or feeding operation being considered, and are there ways to mitigate those risks with the design of the effort? Finally, how do the short-term benefits and risks associated with winter feeding or baiting compare with long-term expectations? Overall, the conversations and decisions to feed or bait are not simple. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about winter feeding of elk and mule deer. Please check out our website for future installments of the State of Deer and Elk in Idaho.